Section 2. Shells of Between the Lines by Boyd Cable. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To the right, a violent artillery bombardment has been in progress. Actual extract from official dispatch. Number two platoon of the Royal Blanks was cooking its breakfast with considerable difficulty and an astonishing amount of cheerfulness when the first shell fell in front of their firing trench. It had rained most of the night, as indeed it had rained most of the past week or the past month. All night long the men had stood on the firing step of the trench, chilled and miserable in their sodden clothing, and sunk in soft sticky mud over the ankles. All night long they had peeped over the parapet or fired through the loopholes at the German trench a hundred yards off, and all night long they'd been galled and stung by that, quote, desultory rifle fire that the dispatches mention so casually and so often, and that requires to be endured throughout a dragging day and night before its ugliness and unpleasantness can be realized. Number two platoon had two casualties for the night. A corporal, who had paused too long in looking over the parapet while a star shell flared and caught it, neatly through the forehead, and a private who, in the act of firing through a loophole, had been hit by a bullet which glanced off his rifle barrel and completed its resulting ricochet in the private's eyes and head. There were other casualties further along the trench, but outside the immediate ken of Number 2 Platoon, until they were assisted or carried past on their way to the ambulance. Just after daybreak, the desultory fire and the rain together had almost ceased, and Number 2 Platoon set about trying to coax cooking fires out of damp twigs and fragments of biscuit boxes, which had been carefully treasured and protected in comparative dryness inside the men's jackets. The breakfast rations consisted of army bread, heavy lumps of a doughy elasticity one would think only within the range of badness of a comic paper's Mrs. Newlywed, flint-hard biscuits, cheese, and tea. The only complaint against the rations being too much plum jam, said a clay-smeared private, quoting from a much derided eyewitness report, as he dug out a solid streak of uncooked dough from the centre of his half-loaf and dropped it in the brazier. Then the first shell landed. It fell some yards outside the parapet, and a column of sooty black smoke shot up and hung heavily in the damp air. Number two platoon treated it lightly. "'Good morning,' said one man cheerfully, nodding toward the black cloud. "'And have we not used pears soap?' "'Bless me, if it ain't our old friend the coal box said another. "'We haven't met one of his sort for weeks back.' "'And it is pal Whistling Willie.' said a third, and they sat listening to the rise and fall, whistling sh 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 of a high-angle shell. As the whistle rose to a shriek, the group of men half made a move to duck, but they were too late, and the shell burst with a thunderous bang just short of the front parapet. Mud and lumps of earth splashed and rattled down into the trench, and fragments of iron hurtled singing overhead. The men cursed angrily. The brazier had been knocked over by a huge clod. Half boiling water was spilt, and worst of all, the precious dry wood had fallen in the mud and water of the trench bottom. But the men soon had other things than a lost breakfast to think of. A shrapnel crashed overhead and a little to the right, and a sharp scream that died down into deep groans told of the first casualty. Another shell, and then another, roared up and smashed into the soft ground behind the trench, hurting no one but driving the whole line to crouch low in the narrow pit. "'Get down and lie close, everyone!' shouted the young officer of Number 2 platoon. But the crump, crump, crump of another group of falling shells spoke sterner and more imperative orders than his. For half an hour the big shells fell with systematic and regular precision along the line of the front trench, behind it on the bare ground, and further back toward the supports trench. The shooting was good but so were the trenches, deep and narrow and steep-sided, with dugouts scooped under the bank, and strong traverses localizing the effect of any shell that fell exactly on the trench. There were few casualties, and the Royal Blanks were beginning to congratulate themselves on getting off so lightly, as the fire slackened and almost died away. 
With the rest of the line, number two platoon was painfully moving from its cramped position and trying to stamp and shake the circulation back into its stiffened limbs, when there came a sudden series of swishing rushes and sharp vicious cracks overhead, and ripping thuds of shrapnel across and across the trench. The burst of fire from the light guns was excellently timed. Their high velocity and flat trajectory landed the shells on their mark without any of the whistling rush of approach that marked the bigger shells and gave time to duck into any available cover. The one gust of light shells caught a full dozen men, as many as the half-hour's work of the big guns. Then the heavies opened again as accurately as before and twice as fast. The trench began to yawn in wide holes and its sides to crumble and collapse. Number two platoon occupied a portion of the trench that ran out in a blunted angle, and it caught the worst of the fire. One shell, falling just short of the front parapet, dug a yawning hole, and drove in the forward wall of the trench in a tumbled slide of mud and earth. A dugout and the two men occupying it were completely buried, and the young officer scurried and pushed along to the place shouting for spades. A party fell to work with frantic haste, but all their energy was wasted. The occupants of the buried dugout were dead when at last the spades found them, and broken fingernails and bleeding fingertips told a grisly tale of the last desperate struggle for escape and for the breath of life. The officer covered the one convulsed face and staring eyes with his handkerchief, and a private placed a muddy cap over the other. "'Get back to your places and get down,' said the officer quietly and the men crawled back and crouched low again. For a full hour the line lay under the flail of the big shells that roared and shrieked overhead and thundered crashing along the trenches. For a full hour the men barely moved, except to shift along from a spot where the shaken and crumbling parapet gave insufficient cover from the hailing shrapnel that poured down at intervals, and from the bullets that swept in and smacked venomously into the back of the trench through the shell rifts in the parapet. A senior officer made his way slowly along the sodden and quaking trench. He halted beside the young officer and spoke to him a few minutes, asking what the casualties were and hoping vaguely they would ease off presently. "'Can't our own guns do anything?' asked the youngster. "'Or won't they let us get out and have a go at them?' A senior nodded toward the bare stretch of muddy plough before their trench and the tangle of barbed wire beyond. "'How many men do you suppose would get there?' he asked. Well, "'Some would,' said the youngster eagerly. "'And anything would be better than sticking here and getting pounded to pieces.' Uh, "'We'll see,' said the Major, moving off. "'They may ask us to try it presently, uh, and if not, we'll pull through, I dare say. "'See that the men keep down, and uh, keep down yourself, Grant. "'Watch out for our ruts, though. "'This may be a preparation for something of the sort.' He moved along, and the lad flattened himself again against the side of the wet trench. A word from a man near him turned him round. A Terry observer officer coming. Perhaps our guns are going for him at last. The gunner officer stumbled along the trench toward them. Behind him came his signaller, a coil of wire and a portable telephone in a leather case swung over his shoulder. Number two platoon watched their approach with eager anticipation and strained ears and attention to catch the conversation that passed between their officer and the artilleryman. And a thrill of disappointment pulsed down the line at the gunner's answer to the first question put to him. Uh, no, he said, I have orders not to fire unless they come out of the trenches to attack. We'll give them jip if they try it. My guns are laid on the front trench, and I can sweep the whole of this front with shrapnel. But why not shut up their guns and put a stop to this? asked the officer, and his platoon fervently echoed the question in their hearts. "'Not my pigeon,' said the gunner, cautiously peering through the field glasses he leveled through a convenient loophole. "'That's the heavy's job. I'm field, and my guns are too light to say much to these fellows. Look out!' And he stooped low in the trench as the rising rush of sound told of a shell coming down near them. Yeah, "'That's about an eight-inch,' he said. After the shell had fallen with a crash behind them, a spout of earth and mud leaping up and spattering down over them, and fragments singing and whizzing overhead. Just uh, tap in on the wire, Jackson, and raise the battery. The telephonist opened his case and lifted out his instrument. 
groped along the trench wall a few yards and found his wire, joined up to his instruments, dashed off a series of dots and dashes on the buzzer, and spoke into his mouthpiece. Number two platoon watched in fascinated silence, and again gave all their attention to listening as the artillery officer took the receiver. That you, Major? As is Arbuthnot, in the forward firing trench. Yeah, yes, pretty lively. Big stuff they're flinging mostly in some fourteen pounder shrap. No, no. No signs of a move in their trenches. All right, sir. I'll take care. I can't see very well from here, so I'm going to move along a bit. Very well, sir. I'll tap in again, higher up. Goodbye. He handed back the instrument to the telephonist. Back up again, he said, and come along. When he had gone, number two platoon turned eagerly on the telephonist, and he ran a gauntlet of anxious questions as he followed the forward officer. Nine out of ten of the questions were to the same purpose, and the gunner answered them with some sharpness. He turned angrily at last on one man who put the query in broad Scots accent. Now, he said tartly, we ain't trying to silence their guns. And if you particular wants to know why we ain't, well, perhaps them Glasgow townies of yours can tell you. He went on, and number two platoon sank to grim silence. The meaning of the gunner's words were plain enough to all. For had not the papers spoken for weeks back of the Clyde strikes and the shortage of munitions? And the thoughts of all were pithily put in the one sentence by a private of number two platoon. I'd stop cheerful in this blanky hell for a week, he said slowly. If so be I had them strikers here alongside me getting the same dose. All this time there had been a constant, though not a heavy, rifle fire on the trenches. It had not done much damage, because the royal blanks were exposing themselves as little as possible and keeping low down in their narrow trenches. But now the German rifles began to speak faster, and the fire rose to a dull roar. The machine guns joined in, their sharp ratchet attacks sounding hard and distinct above the rifles. As the volume of rifle fire increased, so for a minute did the shell fire until the whole line of the Royal Blank's trenches was vibrating to the crash of the shells and humming with rifle bullets which whizzed overhead or smacked with loud whip-crack reports into the parapet. The officer of Number 2 platoon hitched himself higher on the parapet and hoisted a periscope over it. Almost instantly a bullet struck it, shattering the glass to fragments. He lowered it and hastily fitted a new glass pausing every few moments to bob his head up over the parapet and glance hastily across at the German trench. A second time he raised his instrument to position, and in less than a minute it was shot away for a second time. The artillery officer came hurrying and stumbling back along the trench, his telephonist laboring behind him. They stopped at the place where they had uh, tapped in before, and the telephonist busied himself connecting up his instrument. The artillery officer flung himself down beside the platoon commander. My confounded wire cut again, he panted, just when I wanted it to. Sounds as if they meant a rush, hm? The infantryman nodded. Will they stop shelling before they rush? he shouted. Not till their men are well out in front. The guns can keep going over their heads for a bit. Are you through, Jackson? Tell the battery to eyes front. It looks like an attack. The telephonist repeated the message, listened a moment, and commented, "'The Major says, sir,' when his officer interrupted sharply, Three rounds, gunfire, quick!' Three rounds, gunfire, quick, sir,' bellowed the telephonist into his mouthpiece. "'Here they come, lads! Let them have it!' yelled the platoon commander, and commenced himself to fire through a loophole. At the same moment there came from the rear the quick thudding reports of the British guns, the rush of the shells overhead, and the sharp crash of their shells over the German parapets. "'All fired, sir,' called the telephonist. "'Battery fire, one second. the observing officer shouted without turning his head from his watch over the parapet. "'Number one fired, two fired, three fired!' The signaler called rapidly, and the observing officer watched narrowly the white cotton wool clouds of the bursting shrapnel of his guns. Number three, ten minutes more right. All guns, drop twenty-five, repeat, he ordered, and in swift obedience the guns began to drop their shrapnel showers, sweeping along the ground in front of the German trench. But the expected rush of Germans hung fire. 
A line of bobbing heads and shoulders had showed above the parapet, and only a few scattered groups had clambered over its top. "'They're beat!' shouted the infantry officer exultingly. "'They're dodging back! Give it to them, boys! Give it out!' He broke off and ducked down with a hand clapped to his cheek where a bullet had scored its way. "'Get down! Get down! Make your men get down!' said the gunner officer rapidly. "'It's all—' Again there came the swishing rush of the light shells, a series of quick following bangs and a hail of shrapnel tearing across the trench before the men had time to duck. "'Oh, a false alarm just a dodge to get your men's head up within reach of their fizz-bang shrapnel,' said the artilleryman and called to the signaller. "'All guns raised twenty-five. Section fire five seconds.' "'Hello, hit,' he continued to the platoon officer, as he noticed him wiping a smear of blood from his cheek. "'Just a nice little scratch,' said the lad, grinning. "'Nuff to let me swank about being wounded and show off a pretty scar to my best girl when the war's over.' "'Afraid that last shrapnel burst gave some of your fellows more than a pretty scar,' said the gunner. "'But I suppose I'd better slow my guns again. "'Jackson, tell them the uh, attack's evidently stopped.' Section fire ten seconds. Well, can't you keep on belting them for a bit? asked the platoon officer. Might make them ease up on us. The gunner shook his head regretfully. I'd ask nothing better, he said. I could just give those trenches beans. But our orders are strict and we daren't waste a round on anything but an attack. I'll bet that's my major wanting to know if he can't slack off a bit more, he continued as the signaller called something about wanted to speak here sir he went to the instrument and held a short conversation told you so he said when he returned to the infantry officer no attack no shells we're stopping again doesn't seem to be too much stop about the germs grumbled the infantryman as another series of cracking shells shook the ground close behind them he moved down the line speaking a few words here and there to the crouching men of his platoon this is getting serious, he said when he came back to his place. There's more than half of my lot hit, and the most of them pretty badly. These shrapnel bullets and shell splinters make a shocking mess of a wound, you know. Yes, the gunner said grimly. I know. A perfectly brutal mess, the subaltern repeated. A bullet now is more or less decent, but those shells of theirs, they don't give a man a chance to pull through. "'Ours are as bad, if that's any satisfaction to you,' said the gunner. "'I suppose so,' agreed the subaltern. "'Ghastly sort of game altogether, isn't it? "'Those poor fellows of mine now, the, the killed, I mean, "'think of their fathers and mothers and wives or sweethearts.' "'I'd rather not,' said the gunner. "'And I shouldn't advise you to. "'Better not to think of these things.' "'I wish they'd come again,' said the platoon commander. It would stop the shells for a bit, perhaps. They're getting on my nerves. One's so helpless against them, sticking here waiting to know when the next will drop. And they don't give us, fellow, the ordinary four-to-one chance of a casualty being a wound only. They make such a cruel, messy smash of a fellow. Are you going? Must find that break in my wire, said the gunner. And presently he and the telephonist ploughed off along the trench. The bombardment continued with varying intensity throughout the day. There was no grand finale, no spectacular rush or charge, no crashing assault, no heroic hand-to-hand -hand combats, no anything but the long-drawn agony of lying still and being hammered by the crashing shells. This was no artillery preparation for the assault, although the Royal Blanks did not know that, and so dare not stir from the danger zone of the forward trench. They were not even to have the satisfaction of giving back some of the punishment they had endured, nor the glory, a glory carefully concealed from their friends at home, and mostly lost by the disguising or veiling of their identity in the newspapers, but still a glory of taking a trench or making a successful attack or counter-attack. It was merely another, quote, heavy artillery bombardment, lived through and endured all unknown, as so many had been endured. The Royal Blanks were relieved at nightfall when the fire had died down. The artillery observing officer was just outside the communication trench at the relief hour and saw the casualties being helped or carried out. A stretcher passed and the figure on it had a muddy and dark-stained blanket spread over, 
and an officer's cap and binoculars on top. "'An officer?' asked the gunner. "'Who is it?' "'Mr. Grant, sir,' said one of the stretcher bearers dully. "'Number two platoon.' The gunner noted the empty sag of the blanket where the head and shoulders should have been outlined, and checked the half-formed question of badly hit to how was it? Shell, sir. A fizz bang hit the parapet just where he was lying. Caught him fair. The bearers moved on, leaving the gunner groping in his memory for a sentence in the youngster's last talk he had heard. Ghastly business. Cruel, messy smash, he murmured. Beg pardon, sir, said the telephonist. The forward officer made no answer, but continued to stare after the disappearing stretcher-bearers. The signaller shuffled his feet in the mud and hitched up the strap of the instrument on his shoulder. "'I suppose it's over now, sir,' he said. "'Yes, all over. Except for his father or mother or sweetheart,' said the officer absently. The signaller started. Uh, "'I meant the shelling, sir.' "'Oh, ah, yes.' The shelling, Jackson. Yes, I dare say that's over for tonight, since they seem to have stopped now. Perhaps we might see about some food, sir, said the signaller. Food, yes, to be sure, said the officer briskly. Eat, drink, and be merry, Jackson, for... I'm hungry, too, now I think of it. And, oh, Lord, I'm tired. Number two platoon were tired, too, as they filed wearily out by the communication trench, tired and worn out mentally and physically, and yet not too tired or too broken for a light word or a jest. From the darkness behind them a German flare soared up and burst, throwing up bushes and shattered buildings, sandbag parapets, broken tree stumps, sticks and stones in luminous-edged silhouette. A machine-gun burst into a stutter of fire, the report sounding faint at first, and louder and louder as the muzzle swept round its arc. <laughs> the bullet swept overhead, and Number 2 platoon halted and crouched low in the shallow communication trench. "'Oh, shut it, blast ye!' growled one of the men disgustedly. "'Ain't we had enough for one day?' "'It's only him singing his little evening hymn as usual.' said another. Just say it as good-bye and send in a few parting souvenirs. And another sang, Say your revoir, but not good-bye. Stop that howling there, a sergeant called down the line. And stop smoking those cigarettes and talking. Certainly, sergeant, a voice came back. And please, sergeant, will you allow us to keep on breathing? The light died, and the line rose and moved on, squelching softly in the mud. A man clapped a hand to his pocket, half halted, and exclaimed in annoyance, "'Blast if I haven't left my mouth organ back there,' he said. "Hut," said his next file. "'Be glad you've a mouth left, or a head to have a mouth in. It might be worse, and you might be left back to yourself decorating about ten square yards of trench.' <laughs> went the maxim behind them again. Oh, tut tut yourself, you stammer and split blighter, said the disconsolate mouth organ loser. And do you think we can chance a smoke yet? As the platoon moved out on the road and behind the shelter of some ruined house walls. Platoon by platoon, the company filed out and formed up roughly behind the houses. The order to move came at last, and the ranked fours swung off, tramping slowly and stolidly in silence until someone struck up a song. Crump, 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 says the big bursting shells. A chorus of protest and a Give the shells a rest, stopped the song on the first line, and it was to the old regimental tune, the canteen and sing-song favorite, the sergeant's return, that the royal blanks settled itself into its packed shoulder straps and tramped on. On the same old fellow that you always used to know, oh, Oh, you know you used to know. And it's years since we parted way down on Plymouth Ho. Oh, oh, so many years ago. I've roamed around the world, but I've come back to you. For me art has never altered, me art is ever true. Prolonged and noisy imitation of a kiss. 
ain't that got the taste you always used to know the colonel was talking to the adjutant in the road as the companies moved past and he noted with some concern the ragged ranks and listless movement of the first lot to pass they're looking badly tucked up he said oh, they've had a cruel day said the adjutant that's the worst kind agreed the o c and i doubt if they can stand that sort of thing so well now the old regiment is not what it used to be we're so filled up with recruits now youngsters too there's b company about the rawest of the lot and caught the worst of it today how do you think they stand it but it was b company that answered the question for itself and the old regiment singing the answer softly to itself and the o c as it trudged by on the same old feller as your always used to know oh oh you know you used to know gad malcolm said the o c straightening his own shoulders they'll do they'll do me art has never altered me art is ever true a remnant of number two platoon sang past him they haven't shaken us yet said the o c proudly tut, tut, grumbled the maxim faintly tut, tut. End of section two.